So 79 years ago to this day, on September 2nd of 1945, the Japanese signed a declaration of unconditional surrender. They signed the surrender on the deck of the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. At the time, the United States had been at war for almost four years. Given the level of importance of that, of this date, I found a video from the National Archives documenting the entire surrender of Japan. And I think it would be interesting. I think a lot of you would find it fascinating. So I wanted you to be able to have an opportunity to check it out. So let's watch. That's old timey. Japan surrenders. All right. 1931. 1931. Japanese troops leave for the conquest of Manchuria. Japan, the first of this war's aggressor nations, starting out a full 14 years ago on a career of international conquest and killing. 14 years. Shanghai in 1937. Uh -oh. Full-scale warfare against China. The world was still unready to deal properly with such wanton aggression. Japan's diplomats addressing the League of Nations attempted to justify their crimes against peace and decency, and then walked out. That's right. They had the League of Nations back then. They didn't have NATO yet. They didn't. I also didn't have the United Nations yet. The long series of brutal attacks upon an unprepared neighbor continued. Japan seized a whole new empire, set up puppet rulers, grew even more self-confident and aggressive as she fed on other people's suffering. Japan's successful imperialism encouraged other aggressors. Italy invaded Ethiopia. Later, Germany and Italy, by military intervention, helped overthrow the Republican government in Spain. Three nations toasted the consummation of an infamous alliance, the Axis Military Pact of 1940. Germany and Italy, who had plunged Europe into war, became fully united with Japan in the strategy of terror. And through it all, bleeding, pillaged China continued as the scene of misery and death. Millions of her people were made homeless. With indomitable... The craziest part about this whole thing is that Japan was like the big-time aggressor in the Pacific back then, and now it's like the big bad wolf is China out there. You know, and it's like now we're like super close allies with Japan and we work with them. Uh, we do bilateral training, training exercises on a regular basis with them. And we work with them very closely, along with a lot of other um, nations in the Pacific, like the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, things like that. So it's just interesting how things have changed so much in, I don't know, only 80 years. That's not that long. Courage, but pathetically inadequate weapons the Chinese fought back. Alone, they kept the resistance to Japanese imperialism alive. Kurosu and Nomura, Japanese envoys to the United States, described themselves as missionaries of friendship and peace. While they were still negotiating, their countrymen struck a savage blow unparalleled in infamy. Pearl Harbor, December the 7th, 1941. Which, by the way, if you're not tracking, like, that's the entire reason that we got into World War II. Uh, if they hadn't bombed Pearl Harbor... There's a possibility we may not have ever gotten involved or it might have taken even longer for us to get involved because, like, we were super isolationists and we were taking that stance of isolationism. Like, hey, look, this doesn't have anything to do with me. You guys figured out, like, we, we participated in World War I. We're not really looking forward or looking to get into another entanglement right now. But after this happened, that was pretty much like, you know, the decision was made at that point. In spite of crippling damage, the United States fleet, augmented by British, Australian, and Dutch units, set out to find the enemy. 
In the battles of the Coral Sea and Midway, the Japanese advance was halted. Even as the enemy made fast his grip on Hong Kong, Burma, Manila, Singapore, the Allies began the long journey back at Guadalcanal. Step by step, the Guadalcanal. Japanese were beaten back. At Bougainville, Tarawa, Bougainville. Kwajalein, Saipan, Guam. In the Philippines, under Japanese rule, Allied prisoners had been subjected to indescribable suffering. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys are tracking on that, but the stuff that happened... So, yeah, they're talking about the Bataan Death March, I believe, in the Philippines during World War II. Uh, there was a three-month battle in Bataan in the Philippines, and we ended up an army general... Major General Edward P. King surrendered to Colonel Mutu Nakayama of the 14th Army. And he went against his superior's orders and told his troops to lay down their arms, accepting personal responsibility for the surrender. And uh, so, yeah, the Bataan Death March forced 60,000 to 80,000 Filipino and American prisoners of war to march through the Philippines. And the route was about 65 miles long and stretched from the peninsula to the railhead inland. It was an absolute tragedy, like hardcore tragedy. Anybody who fell or attempted to escape or stopped to quench their thirst at a roadside spigot or puddle were summarily shot or bayoneted by the Japanese. Apparently, the Japanese guards killed between 7,000 and 10,000 men during the death march as they kept no records and no one knows the exact number. If a man fell, it was almost certain death enough unless somebody else could pick him up and support him. The former Philippine Army Camp, Camp O'Donnell, that they were being marched to could only accommodate up to about 10,000 men, but the, Jam the Japanese crammed about 60,000 survivors of the death march into the camp. Uh, there was very little running water, hardly any food, and no medical care. Only slit trenches along the sides of the camp for sanitation, and it was blisteringly hot. Um, about 400 people died per day, and it was so bad that by July of 1942, the Japanese replaced the camp commander and moved the American prisoners to another camp. Um, crazy. It was, a, it was an absolute tragedy. So anyway, back to the video. The Filipino people had never stopped fighting. Douglas MacArthur had promised them, I shall return, and return he did. Iwo Jima, only 450 miles from Japan. The full power of the American Pacific fleets of land, sea, and air forces, tirelessly rehearsed in combat through scores of swift amphibious invasions, struck a semi-final blow. The Japanese dead ran into the hundreds of thousands, and once again, a flag of liberty was dramatically run up. Under General Buckner, who gave his life there, combined American forces fought the long and costly campaign for Okinawa in the Ryukyu at the very doorstep of Japan. It was Japan's final hour, and in incredibly furious combat, enemy soldiers had to be destroyed cave by cave and one by one. I don't know if you're tracking this, but the bloodiest battle of the Pacific was the Battle of Okinawa. Like, by far. By far, it was the bloodiest battle of the entire Pacific theater. Um, so out of the American casualties, there was 49,000 American casualties, including 12,520 killed or missing and 36,631 wounded in the Battle of Okinawa. Japanese casualties were around 90,000 who died dead. And there's some estimates that claim that over 100,000 Okinawan civilians died during that battle. 24 service members received the Medal of Honor for actions performed during the battle. Insane. The Navy also lost 36 ships and had 368 ships get seriously damaged. 4,900 men were killed or drowned and 4,800 men were wounded. They also lost 763 aircraft. Insane. Insane numbers. Totally wild. But finally, their morale cracked open by American power. The first masses of Japanese soldiers began to give up voluntarily. Japan's fanatical suicide corps and desperation air attacks inflicted heavy damage on American naval forces off Okinawa. This was kamikaze. It was sensational. 
but it could never stop the Allied advance. Wow. Insane. Dude, I can't imagine being on one of those ships, having planes like crash into it. That is just nuts. Admiral Halsey. Perfected by Allied scientists. First mission, the industrial city of Hiroshima. Second mission, the port of Nagasaki. Japan had its choice. Complete surrender or complete ruin. At Potsdam, even as they laid the foundations for a stable European peace, Clement Attlee, Harry Truman, and Joseph Stalin had decided on common action against Japan. All right, everybody take a look at that guy at the bottom right. That's Brosif Stalin. I'm just kidding. That's Joseph Stalin. That was the guy who was the leader of Russia, the Soviet Union at the time. That dude was responsible for so many people dying, including his own people. Okay, so the next, the closest number I could find says that according to historians who studied Soviet archives before and after the fall of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin likely was responsible for the deaths of between 6 and 20 million people. 6 and 20 million people. That is like so many people, it would change the entire carbon footprint of the planet. Just to give you an idea of what kind of a guy he was. Anyway, back to the video. As agreed at Yalta, Russia joined the Allies in war on the last remaining Axis enemy. Japan's stronghold in Manchuria was attacked. For Emperor Hirohito and for Japanese militarism, the war was lost. Japan sued for peace. In Washington, Secretary of War Stimson and Secretary of State Burns hurried to the White House. Secretary of War. Secretary of Navy Forrestal. The United States Cabinet, meeting with President Truman, studied Japan's surrender messages. Very different. In full coordination with the governments of Britain, China, and Russia, and other allies. The world remembered Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Commander-in-Chief, American war casualty. Years of grave responsibility took their toll. A grateful world honors him today. Douglas MacArthur, leader of Pacific Armies, now named Supreme Allied Commander in Japan. Chiang Kai-shek, leader of Fighting China. Chester Nimitz, commander of the mighty Pacific fleets. Chiang Kai-shek. A lot of history there. Harry S. Truman, four months after taking oath as president, leads his country finally to victory and peace. Mr. Truman and his cabinet meet in emergency session. Former Secretary Hall is on hand as the president breaks the momentous news of Japan's surrender. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Arrangements are now being made for the formal signing of the surrender terms at the earliest possible moment. General Douglas MacArthur has been appointed the Supreme Allied Commander to receive the Japanese surrender. Great Britain, Russia, and China 
will be represented by high-ranking officers. Meantime, the Allied Armed Forces have been ordered to suspend offensive action. The proclamation of VJ Day must await upon the formal signing of the surrender terms by Japan. Newsmen Man, president's report to it's wild seeing Harry Truman talking. Tuesday, August 14th, the fateful news is flashed. In New York City, as throughout a rejoicing nation and world, vast throngs of grateful, happy people celebrate the end of fighting, the dawn of peace. Two million New Yorkers jam Times Square. It's official. It's all over. It's total victory. That's so crazy. It's crazy to think that like we used to like go out in droves when we when people were like finally some peace like finally everyone surrender like they surrendered we're gonna have some peace and like everyone's out there in droves and there's tons of service members out there too like sailors marines probably people that are home on leave like it's so weird man times times are very different now people are in the streets in mass like that for totally different reasons. You know? Anyway. Let's finish this out. I love it. Putting the mirror the American flag up. You know what's really crazy to me? Something I was just thinking of? Most of the people in that particular clip right there, most of the people that were in this clip when this was recorded are probably dead. Most of them, if not all of them. That is a very sobering thought. Time passes really fast, you know, so don't waste it. Yeah, you think. You think, but, uh... Dude, that's crazy. Unfortunately, there's a lot of money to be made in defense. There's a lot of other stuff going on, of course, but... Yeah, it's, cra it's crazy. It's been that long. 79 years ago. 79 years ago. That means if your average person in that picture at the end there was, like, 30, then they'd be 109 years old right now if they were in their 30s. So... And most of those people were like probably between the age of like 18 and, you know, 40 something, maybe. I don't know. Crazy how fast time goes by, but more than 400,000 Americans died during that conflict. So it's a good thing that we were able to find peace. Hopefully we can still continue to find ways to peace now, but we'll see. I guess only time will tell.